I'm originally from the Netherlands and I have been living in Great Britain for the last 16 years and I'm now a professor of education at Brunel University in London. Um, and in my presentation today I spoke about education and the idea of grown-upness um, and I gave the talk the, the title Being at Home in the World. Um, and a lot of the, the ideas in the presentation have to do with the question what it means to be in the world, to be at home in the world, and what education can do there. Um, last year I published a book called The Beautiful Risk of Education. And in that book I write a lot about the, the need to understand education as a weak process, where not everything can be controlled or programmed. Um, and I did that in response to a big tendency I see in many countries to really organize education um, and make it into some kind of what I call a, a machine that produces predictable learning outcomes. And for me, when that happens, I think something is lost in education. I refer to a, a favorite author of mine, a, a French educationalist, Philippe Merieux, who says this desire to want to fix education, want to control it, and then measure everything and create league tables, is actually an infantile desire. And he calls it an infantile desire because it denies the reality of education. And part of the reality of education is that education is always about human beings who are in interaction, in communication, in dialogue. But also education should ultimately support the, the freedom of the child. And if we make education totally into control, we miss this important dimension of the freedom of human beings more generally. Um, so my point is that in the current policy climate, it looks like education is out of balance with too much emphasis on measuring, comparing, deciding who is best and uh, who is better, um, and too little attention for education as a, a broader human project of formation. But I'm not alone in that critique, because there are actually a lot of people who say um, that education is going in the wrong direction with all the measurement and everything. But then they often say what education needs to do is to focus on the child, make sure that children can develop all their talents and their full potential, uh, that learning has to be tailored to individual children, so the idea that education has to be personalized, flexible, that teachers are the facilitators of that, that children should be allowed to express their creativity make their own meaning, find their identity, and so on. And what I do in my talk is to say that that for me is actually not a helpful response, because before you know it, you end up just in a position that is the opposite of control, that thinks that human freedom is a question of having no constraints. Um, I call it in my talk, freedom as sovereignty, the idea that you're completely sovereign and that no one can interfere with you. Um, and what I do is then argue that that actually is also an, an infantile idea, that to be free as human beings would mean that we are not in communication, not in dialogue. So I see these as two opposite positions that are just a mirror image of each other and both have problems. Um, and then the main thing I, I try to do in my presentation is to see, is there a third way? Can we think in a different way about education where we respond to this problem with measurement, but don't think that the solution is just for children to express themselves and for teachers to facilitate that. And the suggestion I do is in an answer to a question I pose where I say, what is really the, the task of education? What is that that educators should be concerned about? Um, 
And the answer I formulate is to say education should help children and young people to exist in the world in a grown-up way. And I have a, a very precise formulation where I say, and I need to check, it, it's the task of education is to, to fuel the desire in children to want to exist in the world in a grown-up way. Um, and for me, the existence is important. So I think that ultimately there is a question for all of us as human beings, how we can exist in the world. Um, that is far less a question of identity. There is an awful lot of talk about identity, finding your identity, that always looks only back to ourselves. The question of existing means where we live with other human beings on a planet. Um, so the existence is important, the world is important, that's the only place where we can really live. And then this idea of grown-upness, uh, which is quite an old idea and a lot of people say it's an outdated idea and we shouldn't talk about grown-upness in education. But I think it's an idea worth looking at again. Um, but then my point is that I don't want to understand grown-upness as the outcome of some kind of development process where we say children are not grown up and then if they learn enough and do enough then suddenly they are grown up and they are that for the rest of their lives. Um, I approach grown-upness as a, a way in which we try to live our lives and then I make a distinction between you can say a way of living your life where you put yourself in the center of the universe. Um, I call that with a philosophical term an ego logical way of being. So it's the logic of the ego. And then there is another way to exist where you actually try to make room for other human beings, for living nature and everything that is around you. And I call that a non ego logical way of being where you don't put yourself in the center. Um, and this favorite French author of mine puts that very nicely where he says, the real challenge for us human beings is to be in the world without being in the center of the world. So I play with that and say, what we're after in education is to help children and young people to be eccentric in the literal sense of the word out of the center, that they don't think of themselves in the center of the world. Um, I sometimes call that world-centered education um, because it ultimately focuses on how we are in the world. And there are other traditions in education. There is a strong child-centered tradition and a strong curriculum-centered tradition. So world-centered tries to respond and yeah, find something that is different from just focusing on the child or just on the curriculum. So this is the, the framing of my talk and, and what I do a lot in my talk is then say things about what does this mean for how we do education, um, how should we understand the place of education and what is there for teachers to do. And I'll give some flavor of the, the ideas I play with there. Um, one idea is that um, if it is the task for education to help children to be in the world, then the question is, how do we come in the world? And there is a, a philosopher I use here, Hannah Arendt, who first of all points to the fact that a lot of philosophy always says what is special about human beings is their mortality, that they will die and that they know that they will die. And Arendt says there is actually something far more interesting and that's the fact that we are being born. So she talks about natality and says, this is the, the miracle of life that constantly new beings are being born. Um, so she talks about human beings as beginners. Um, and actually, we constantly can begin things. When we speak or when we move, we begin something. And the interesting point she then makes is, how can these beginnings come really into the world, because when we begin, they only belong to us. Um, and then she says, that only happens if other people do something with our beginnings. So if I speak and 
no one listens or no one does something with it, then it's only my speaking. So to come into the world, other people need to respond to that, pick it up, do something with it. But other people are also beginners. Um, so we shouldn't expect that they pick up our beginnings in the way in which we intended them or the way in which we want them to be picked up. Other people have the freedom to do that in their own ways. Um, and Aran says that's really frustrating, but this is what it means to be in the world, that you need to accept that other people do things with your beginnings uh, that are beyond your control. When you try to control that, then you create a world in which you can get your beginnings in the world, but no one else can do that. So if we really believe that this is important for everyone, then this is what it means to, to be in the world. So it means that we need to live with the fact that we need to let go a bit of what we want uh, and accept this difficulty that other people are other people. Um, so that's one point I make, and I think it's really important for education to have an awareness of this, so that you do not think that education is just about sort of letting all children express themselves and never ask what happens with what they express. The other theoretical point is about the idea of uniqueness, um, because I think education also needs a notion of uniqueness. You can say the idea that every child counts in some way, and I think that's important. Um, what I then do is say the common way to understand uniqueness is as difference. So we say this child is unique because in some ways it differs from every other child in the world. It has particular talents or particular qualities or capacities. The problem with understanding uniqueness in that way is that it very quickly begins to isolate people from each other because uniqueness just means that we compare ourselves against other people and we look for the differences. And ultimately you can say that that is not a way in which we come in connection or in dialogue because we just use other human beings to show how we are different. What I then do, and that comes out of particular philosophy, is to say there's actually another question we can ask about uniqueness, which is not the question, what makes me unique, but the question, when does it matter that I am I? Um, I call that uniqueness as irreplaceability, and that's another way to, to think about uniqueness. And it doesn't ask for my characteristics, but it asks, what are the situations where it really matters that I am there? And I give some examples of those situations, uh, which for me are situations when someone asks you a question, but the question is really a question for you and not just for anybody. Um, I refer to a chapter in a book that discusses this and it gives the example of a friend who is dying and asks whether he can see you. And that is a question where the friend doesn't just want to see someone, but he really wants to see you. So here is a situation where you can say, a question comes to me and I cannot send someone else. There is something, this question sort of singles me out. Um, so you can say in, in moments where we encounter this responsibility, it begins to matter that I am I. Um, we still have the freedom as human beings to do with those questions what we want. So we can say to our friend, sorry it's too difficult, or sorry actually we're not the friends you think we are, and we can walk away from that responsibility. Or we can take that responsibility upon ourselves, and then you can say we, we realize a moment of uniqueness. So uniqueness here is then not something we possess, but it's something we do in interaction or in dialogue. For me, these two ideas, what it means to, to be in the world and get our beginnings in the world, and this idea of uniqueness as irreplaceability, make a big difference for what we do in education. Um, 
particularly when you take this idea of uniqueness, you can see that this is not something you can make or produce. You cannot think of a kind of trajectory that will end up with children who will always make, say, the right choice when they encounter these kind of questions. But you can think of organizing schools in such a way that these kind of questions never even happen within the classroom. So if, a, if the, the job of the school is just to make sure that students uh, make tests and get high scores on it, then these other questions about human interaction begin to disappear from the school. So I make this distinction between education that actually isolates children from those questions. And if you do that in a very strong sense, you can even say that children become immune for even hearing these questions. And education that at least tries to keep this possibility open that children encounter these difficult questions. What they do with those questions is ultimately up to them. But I think it's important that we think of education that keeps things open rather than that it just focuses on building strong individuals. There is nice literature that um, says that a lot of education is talking about how we can empower children, but the, the problem with empowerment is that you can make children so strong that, they, that you create a barrier around yourself. So the idea there is actually education should work on disarmament, should try to keep this barrier a little open so that these questions can come in. So I really like that as a way to think about what education can do here. Which means that for me education is precisely not about building strong identities, but it's about helping children to exist as subjects, as I would call it. Um, and there are situations where education systems build very clear identities, but where that actually prevents children from seeing what there is to do for them in the world. Um, maybe the German education system building up under the Nazis was a system that built very strong identities. And precisely as a result of that, the real needs that people should respond to no longer could touch them. Um, so I think there is important work to do for education, but this is all weak work, so we cannot program it. It's difficult to measure or to plan, but it's a really important part of, of the real life of education. What I then do in the, the, the next step in the talk is, in a sense, make an argument why education should have this particular difficulty and why education should not be just the easy thing focusing on the child. And I do that by talking a bit about the, the importance of the experience of resistance. Um, the experience itself is important. You can say when we begin, when we take initiative, at some point we will encounter resistance. We may have a brilliant idea and we meet another human being who says, I don't think that's a good idea. Or, if we, or we want to create something from material and the material doesn't allow us to do that. That experience is important because it shows us that there is indeed a world outside of us that we haven't constructed. But this is again a frustrating experience. So one way to, to respond to that situation where we encounter resistance is to say, oh, this is really irritating, but I'll try harder to make sure that what I want to do will really happen. Um, at the end of that line, you begin to put so much pressure on the situation that you begin to destroy the thing that offers resistance. So you can say there is a risk that you begin to destroy the world because you want to strongly the world to be as you want it to be. But the, the other sort of response is to say, when you encounter resistance, this is far too difficult for me. I withdraw, I can't engage, I'm gone. And if you look at where that goes, ultimately you destroy yourself by taking yourself out of the world. 
So you can say the, the real challenge when you encounter the reality of the world is to stay in this middle ground between this risk of destroying the world or destroying yourself. Um, and that is where I would place the notion of dialogue, where for me dialogue is not conversation, but dialogue is preci precisely this, this challenge to be together with a world that is different from you. Um, Dialogue is very different, say, from a competition or a contest. You can win a competition, you cannot win a dialogue. Dialogue is an ongoing challenge. Each moment in your life there is the question, is it possible to stay in dialogue so that there is a place for everyone in that interaction? So to stay in that middle ground is really important for education, and that's why for me this is a, a way to describe what the educational space actually is and what the, the dangers are that surround that space. You can say it's an educational space, you can say it's a, a worldly space, and that it's educational is because I think it's, it's a space where you can experience that the world is trying to teach you something. It's trying to teach you, for example, that you're not the only person in the world, that there is a real world there. So the the teaching moment is important there. Um, and then the, the question is, what does that have to do with grown-upness? For me, grown-upness precisely describes um, the situation where you manage to stay in that middle ground, where you manage to acknowledge that it's not just you, but that you remain in dialogue and give place to what happens around you. So you don't put yourself in the center of the world but you do stay in the world. The, the question that you then have to work through is a question that I sometimes formulate as the, the key educational question, which in its shortest form is, is what I desire, is that actually desirable? Is it desirable for my own life? Is it desirable for the life with others and is it desirable for the life we live on this planet and the planet can also not fulfill all of our desires. So that question is what I desire desirable is always a question that sort of interrupts where we are. It interrupts our desires because it asks us to look at our desires. You can say it interrupts our identity, it interrupts our, our own self-image. But I think that interruption is really important because if we work through our desires and transform them so that our desires can begin to sustain a grown-up way of being in the world, then something really important has happened. And for me, a lot of the, the work of, of real educators is to, to give this question to children and, and help children to work with this question, which can be done in all kinds of ways. I think this is generally important, but I also think that nowadays in our parts of the world, we, we live in a world where quite often the, the messages we get are just that we need to get more desires. So two years ago, no one knew that you could even desire an iPhone 6S, and now we can desire it. And that's how a lot of capitalism works. It wants us just to desire more and never to question whether we should desire. But you can see in the ecological crisis that our desires are unsustainable. I also think in the many of the political crises we see the desire for a particular identity leads to the destruction of other identities. So that also shows where that is going wrong. So you can even say that we live in a society that doesn't want us to grow up, to have a grown-up relationship with our desires but actually wants us to stay infantile. And that's quite a worrying conclusion, I think, for a, from an educational perspective. So that's the, the way in which I look at education. And then in the, the final step I ask, so what does that mean for teachers? What is the work of the teacher when you look at education in this way? One thing I do is to remind teachers of this importance of interruption, that they do acknowledge that their task is a really difficult task. Um, 
because interruption is bringing a really difficult question to the child. But you do that with the ambition that ultimately the child will, will see that the desires that are there should be transformed into better life enhancing desires. Um, now, as an educator, at some point, you should disappear from the life of the child or the student. Um, so you, you hope that this question is what I desire. Is that desirable? That ultimately that becomes a, a question that becomes the child's own question. I think then you have done something significant in education. But what you need to do for that is to give children time and space to work with this question, to experience what this question means. And a lot of education is, is really under pressure to produce quick results and doesn't give a lot of time and space. But um, to work with this question, what, what you do with your desires, requires that you give it a, a perspective. There is a the nice example from a Polish educator, I think, who says, if a boy in my classroom or a child in my classroom wants to punch another child in the face, he should be allowed to do that because ultimately we are responsible for our own actions. But then he says, as an educator, before I allow the child to do that, what I ask from them is that they write this intention on a piece of paper and put that piece of paper away for 24 hours and then if they return after 24 hours and they read what they thought yesterday they wanted to do, if they then still think that it is a good idea, then they should give the other child a punch in the face and deal with the consequences. But just by writing it down, by leaving it there for a night, what you begin to do is, is create an opportunity for the child to get a relationship with its own desires. So that's one example of the, the kind of work we, we can do there. And all that is, is meant to help the child to be in this difficult middle ground, to be in the world and try to be there in a grown-up way. Um, so as teachers, we also need to support children to, to stay there. We need to give form to that so that children can really encounter the world in all kinds of ways. And we need to show them that what looks difficult in the short term may become really important in the long term. Uh, but again, education is under so much pressure to produce short term res results that the longer term often simply doesn't come into view. And that also means that we shouldn't shy away from difficulties. Um, and that goes against the tendency to make education easy, to say if this is what children want, and that is what we should give them. Um, I think that what children say that they want is never a good argument for uh, organizing education. Now, some people might say, well, this puts teachers in a, in a very powerful position because then they are the ones who sort of interrupt children's lives. And isn't that precisely what we should get away from? Um, we should get away from that if this is only a question of power, if teachers have the desire to keep children as objects and just treat them as objects. But what the, the orientation of education is, is precisely not for children to remain objects, but to help them to be subjects of their own life. When that happens, you could say, the relationship is not one of power, but it's one of authority, where we, each for us individually, try to figure out what we want to have authority in our lives, what can speak to us, what can teach us. So this transformation of power into authority is really key, but it's a very mysterious process in education. Um, and at the moment, again, I think that in society we have lost the the understanding of this distinction between power and authority. And we think that being free means that no one has power over us. But actually what we need to figure out is what should have authority in our lives. The, the planet with its limited possibilities should have authority in our lives. <laughs>
a democratic way of being with other people should have authority in our lives. And if we try to walk away from that, then we are not grown up. So these are the ideas that are uh, central in my talk. And they look at education not in terms of test scores or learning outcomes, but ask this bigger question, how can education help us to be human beings? So it is education as a humanizing process. And education needs to do something there because ultimately, as human beings, we need to figure out how we can be at home in the world, in this strange place that is always outside of ourselves. And this is a question of ultimately of, of desire, of fueling the desire in children to want to be in the world, want to be outside of themselves. Now if you put it in that way, and that's my final point, it often looks like children are not able to do that and we as people with big bodies are able to do that. I don't think that's true. I th see many children who really have a desire to be in the world and then they encounter systems that actually beat that desire out of them, that destroy that desire. So it's not just a desire we should put into children, we should actually work with the desire that is there. Uh, but it's, I think, really important then to, to help children to stay in the world as this difficult place where we need to live together. So that's roughly what I uh, shared with the, the people in the conference here in relation to education and being at home in the world. <laughs>